I have any questions? Ready to start? Um, I'll usually try to do some sort of little review of uh, what we talked about last time, just to bring us back up to where we have been. Um, joining costs are often equal or exceed the cost of the material that's being used. And in fact, inspection costs are often equal to the joining costs. In fact, somewhere in here, yeah, I may have put it away. I actually found something that I had. Oh, here it is. Um, I did have a nice one typed up once. Okay, this, this is the, if the materials cost might be 10 to 20%, the joining costs are similar, other fabrication is similar, NDE, you know, all these things have similar orders of magnitude. And so it turns out a lot of people in material science think, like to think that the materials are the big cost driver in manufacturing. They're not, okay, sorry. Um, but the, the really big cost drivers are uh, lots of little things added together. Joining happens to be one of those things in manufacturing a real product. The inherent strength of chemical bonds is very high. If you just take the, you know, the force to separate primary bonds, you're talking millions of PSI. We don't have that kind of strength in most materials. <coughs> um, I mean, in a sense, in diamond, we do, because it's all diamonds interlocking primary bonds in the, in the uh, tetrahedral configuration, diamond cubic. Now, the reason most materials don't have very much strength um, is because we have dislocations in metals that allow things to move. In brittle materials, they actually have very high compressive strength, but their um, uh, tensile strength is weak because of fracture mechanics, which uh, is another part of the course. But to give you an idea of dislocations, actually one of the students uh, took the course once, um, said this was the best part of the whole course right here. Okay, but this is the way I illustrate dislocations. And this happens to be an old MIT phone book. I've got to take the, uh, the covers off. And unfortunately, in recent years, um, They've been putting polymers to strengthen the paper. It used to be a, you'd be able to use an old phone book, and the paper dries out and gets a little brittle. So this is an easier thing to do. But um, if you want to rip a telephone book in two, a lot of people say, well, you take the back and you just break the spine. No, no, that's not the way to do it. You, you introduce a dislocation. And the dislocation you introduce is basically just by bending it and then straightening it out. I don't know if this will show up up there. But see how by grabbing it, bending it, and then straightening it out, I put a kink in it, okay? So if I do that, and if I let this dry out, this is a 1999, and I just bend it backwards, okay? So <clears throat> that's just introducing a dislocation by bending it the way I bent it, I make a mess. Oh, uh, I, had, I now am only stressing one piece of paper at a time, right? As I bend it backwards now against itself, and it just snaps one at a time. And that's basically how a dislocation moves through a crystal. In fact, the, the famous story, there were two people independently who came up with the idea of dislocations. One was uh, Pogliani, who I think was a a scientist in England, and this is in the 1930s, and the other was Egon Orowan. In the 1930s, Egon Orowan was in Hungary, his native country. Later, he was a professor of mechanical engineering here at MIT. Uh, he was still here back when I was a, a student. But anyway, um, Egon Orowan got the idea of dislocation because he was in this great big room that had a rug, and a big rug, a big oriental rug on the floor or whatever, and it needed to be moved about two or three inches in one direction. And the cleaning lady was there cleaning, and she needed to move the rug. And he said, uh, oh, I'll help you, because it's a great big heavy rug. And she said, no, I don't need any help. And he watched her, and she just put a little fold in the rug at one end, and she kicked it, kicked the fold across the room. And that moved the whole rug a couple of inches. Now, you know, basically, you take, you know, work as a force through a distance, in that case, she basically took a small force and moved it through a big distance to get a heavy load to move a small distance, right? And that's basically how dislocations move through metals. 
and dislocations lower the strength of metals from their inherent bond strength by a factor of 10 to 50, so far as that goes. So if we could get good bonds, we only need Banerol's bonds, because if I can get 2 million PSI out of a primary bond at 1 or 2 electron volts, Banerol's bonds with uh, a tenth or two tenths of electron volts should theoretically have a strength of 100,000 PSI. And that's all I usually need. It turns out we're going to see in adhesive bonding that, in fact, we usually are kind of dealing with Banerol's bonds. We don't get 100,000 PSI, but, but we get uh, pretty good strength even though it's Banerol's bonding. Uh, surface roughness and surface contamination are the two factors limiting the bonding of, of two materials. And one of the ways that we didn't talk about yesterday, but we will talk about, there are, there are a couple of ways, or various ways, to get, rid around, get around the surface roughness problem. Remember, the surface roughness problem is these things come together like this. One is to interpose a liquid. Okay, if I put a liquid in here, I don't care about how rough the surface is. Well, that's called soldering, brazing, fusion welding. It, most of the adhesive bonding, I'm interposing a liquid, and I don't worry about the surface roughness. What, we, what I showed you yesterday was basically when you have interfacial shear and you just break the mountain peaks apart, that's another way to do it. So there's surface roughness and there's sur surface contamination, and we started talking about surface energy. Um, I often use this. This comes out of a, this in your handout, a book on welding process technology uh, from a long time ago, like 1980 or something. But Peter Holkerhoff was trying, who's the time was the director of the British Welding Institute, and he was trying to plan, he was trying to go, come up with a chart of different welding processes. Well, the American Welding Society lists 199 different welding and joining processes. There's, there's, you know, there's literally hundreds of these different ways people use to join things. But in his classification, he had a source of heat, which in one case there was no heat, which is cold welding. In a, in a shielding method. Okay, well, the source of heat, in a sense, is a way, what he called source of heat, coming down here. Um, in all of this, basic, or mechanical, okay, you can have mechanical. These are ways to get rid of the surface roughness problem. And the shielding method is a way to get rid of the surface contamination problem. I mean, he didn't really have it in very scientific terms, but basically, in his whole thought process, his classification scheme was kind of looking at these two things. How do you get rid of surface roughness? How do you get rid of surface contamination? Okay. Um, we talked about cold welding, and I sent around those little pieces of tantalum um, that uh, just showed and gave you the little picture from the welding handbook that shows how you just push these wires together and you get a lot of shear and you just push the, the contamination out of the way. There are other um, processes where you use a lot of shear to get rid of the surface contamination. One is uh, friction welding. This is a friction welded part. Uh, it's just two bars of steel. Um, friction welding, you basically grab one uh, cylindrical piece that you want to weld, and you take the other part and you spin it at high speed, and you just ram them together, and you let the heat of friction um, soften the material push the material out. Now, I showed you before the pipe, the, the plastic pipe, and in the plastic pipe, we had some flash that came up. Well, that was a case where we heated the plastic to soften it, and we just pushed it together. There wasn't any spinning, and there wasn't a lot of interfacial shear. There was some interfacial shear just pushing the stuff out of the way. In this case, this thing's spinning at several hundred RPM, and it comes in, and you actually, if I pass around, you can actually see some heating around this. In about one or two seconds, this thing will start to glow red, and you basically just forge the material together. But when you forge it, you have to slide the surfaces. If you just push the things together with a straight normal force, you'll get no bonding because the surface contamination is still stuck in between. You know, you've got to get to metal-metal contact on an atomic scale. Okay? Remember, two or three atomic distances, and, and those, those atoms don't see each, uh, each other when you're more than about, let's say, three or four or five. Uh, atomic distances. So that's that's a friction weld. Well, how's it used? Well, in some of the least expensive areas, it's used to join the um, the yoke to a drive shaft 
of, of a car or something like that. Although more and more we're actually getting into fancier drive shafts. Uh, but going back 20 years ago, you'd start with a steel tube and you'd have a yoke. And you remember this is the yoke that has a universal joint, so it has a little cross piece. And you've got two pieces like this that allow the thing to articulate. And you basically grab that yoke and hold it stationary and you'd spin the tube and you'd ram the two together and you'd make a weld in about one or two seconds. And you need welds that are that fast if you're in the automotive business and doing things at 250,000 units a year. I think I mentioned the other day, tack time in the automotive business, if you want to make 250,000 units a year, you've got to do things in about um, 60 seconds. Okay. Um, if I'm going to... If I'm going to make a bunch of these things for more than 250,000 cars, you know, a, a company like GM or Ford making six million cars, or Toyota making six million cars a year, is going to have to have 10 or 20 of these machines set up. Of course, you've got different size drive shafts, so you're going to have different size machines. But anyway, you, you're going to weld those things together. If you get the process parameters set up, the right speed, the right timing, holding it together, um, you'll make very, very consistent welds extremely consistent. If you get things set up wrong, you'll make consistent junk okay, and trash. But once it's set up right, it, it goes quite well. Um, so that's kind of the low end. On the high end, when they want to take two turbine discs from a, for, to making a jet engine, if you're talking Pratt & Whitney or General Electric, and you may have some titanium forging that's been machined down and is worth $20,000 and you got another one that's worth $20,000. And you want to put these together into a complex shape. That's going to, these are the discs that are going to hold the, the turbine blades, right? Um, or the veins, whichever. Here's a vein, okay? Um, this vein's got a ceramic coating on it for heat protection and stuff. We'll talk about some of these things later, probably. But in any case, um, actually, I can pass this one around since I got it out. Um, um, but if I want to make the disc for this, they actually friction weld these discs. You take two $20,000 parts, and you, one of them will stationary, and one of them will spin. These things can be this big around, or, or bigger you know, in diameter. It can be several feet, three feet in diameter. You've seen how big engines are on planes. Um, and they basically just spin them together, and then they, all they have to do is go in there and machine the flash away, and you have a very, very good weld. Made very quickly. Well, it's a solid state weld. You haven't melted anything. You're just forging. You're getting things up hot to where they soften. Um, and depending on the material you're using, I mean, in steels, you have to be careful, make sure it doesn't cool too quickly and you form martensite, which is a brittle material, which is lousy strength if it's untempered martensite because it's too brittle. But in something like titanium, you get property. You can't even see the weld when you're all done. Okay, You might see some grain growth in that area or something, but depending on the titanium alloy. But you can get properties that are equal to the base metal strength. Well, that's one of the nice things is even if it's dirty, you know, as long as it's not too dirty, it basically cleans itself because you're doing so much interfacial shear and you're moving, you're moving, you know, uh, in, in a... In those things, you're probably moving an eighth of an inch of material on either side, and you're losing length as this thing collapses together. And if you ha if you have a, uh, a tight tolerance on your axial dimension, you might have a problem, okay, in controlling things. But you basically you can get reasonable axial tolerance, but um, you know as long as everything's aligned and it's the right metallurgy of the alloy. I mean, it, you know, I'm not sure it would be very good. And 2000 series aluminum alloys may crack. Terribly. But that's inherent in the metallurgy of the alloy. It's not inherent in the process. Okay. Uh, titanium welds very well. Nickel based alloys would weld very well. In fact, one of the things that people wanted to do, actually, the Air Force is starting to do, they wanted to make bladed disc. They called it a BLISC program for bladed disc. So I'm going to make some, uh, okay, BL. You take the BL and you take the ISK and you get BLISC, right? Um, so I've got these 
twenty or thirty or forty thousand dollar disc, and I want to put the blades on there. The problem with the blades, well, let me. If we can talk about blades now, I'll get my other blade out. Um, of all my toys, this is probably the most my favorite. But anyway, um, let's talk a little bit about turbo blades um, and veins and, and bliss programs and stuff. And eventually, I want to get to linear friction welding. Um, when I pass this thing around, it's got a ceramic coating on the surface. It's got holes all through it. Anybody know what the holes are in here for? Cooling, right? Because you blow 1,000 degree F air, basically compressor air, through this thing, form a boundary layer of cold 1,000 degree F air. Because the alloy itself melts around 2,400 F. The gas coming in that's going from your combustion burner is probably coming in at 3,000 F. You actually would melt this if you didn't have the cooling air coming in. And you have to either electron beam or laser drill, usually laser drills nowadays, drill these holes. And we'll get to laser drilling when we get to fusion welding processes and stuff like that. And then you put a ceramic coating on the surface because if anything happens, you don't you want the ceramic to the ceramic can take the temperatures of three thousand degrees F, but only for very brief periods of time, right? So it's basically an insulating a thermal thermal barrier coating, they call it. There's lots of plasma spray joining technology in there. You first have to put on what's called a barrier coat, which is typically a nickel aluminum alloy. Um, and then you put the ceramic on. So you, you lay up several layers because the ceramic doesn't have the same coefficient of expansion as the, as the metal and you don't want it to chip off. So you have to have this somewhat porous thermal barrier coat or metal, metallic pre-coat. This is a... Um, and you, there's lots of welding and joining that goes on in that thing. Both of these guys that I'm passing around, if they were good parts, and they're not good parts, you can tell they're not good parts because they have a corner cut off of somewhere. And that tells any mechanic who's assembling this, if the corner's ground off, the part has been rejected. I mean, this, this one actually has a, got a Pratt & Whitney stamp back here, but it used to have a rejection stamp that's been worn off. But I mean... You might have a rejection stamp, but people could polish off a rejection stamp. Why would someone want to do that? Because both of these are worth about $4,000 if they were brand new good parts. And there are people out there who will go and get rejected parts and sell them counterfeit. And the FBI is always trying to track those people down. Um, but what they do is when they reject them, they break a corner off and there's no way to repair that very easily. And so people kind of know. This is actually a single, was a single crystal. Um, and this is one of my favorite of my little example parts. It's got the laser cut holes. But inside, you actually, they grew this thing very slowly um, as a single crystal, just like the gross silicon single crystals. It's one of the reasons it costs so much. But they also have a little ceramic piece that goes on the inside. This whole thing's made by lost wax casting. Um, and... Uh, they end up with these internal cooling passages. Now, this one's been what they call filleted, filleted, um, by an electrical discharge machining, just so you can see the inside, okay? So now it's a bicrystal, okay? It was a single crystal originally. Um, but the lost wax casting technique is the same way my brass rat was made, if you have a college ring or something like that. Um, and lost wax casting's been, been around for, for centuries, actually millennia, it goes back several thousand years. You basically make a part out of wax, and then you dip it in a slurry of ceramic, and you keep on di dipping it and layering, layering, and make this coating. And then you put the ceramic, which will take high temperatures, into a furnace, and melt out the wax, and now you have a cavity of the shape that you had in plastic. Okay? Or not pla either plastic or, or wax. I actually made my wife's engagement ring out of platinum meridium. Or actually, no, I, I electron beam melted that with the engagement ring. The, the wedding band, the wedding band, uh, I actually did by lost wax casting. And I, the person who did the lost wax casting for me, I just went up here to Central Square and went to a dental technician shop. One of the dentists goes in and tries to sit, you know, you've got to have braces or, you know, or something. Or you have to have a root canal or something. And, and they have to make some metal part. Well, he makes the part out basically in a wax mold to fit, to fit the person's mouth 
and then he sends it out to a dental lab, and the dental lab takes that and does lost wax casting and basically makes a typically a nickel-based super alloy, uh, sometimes palladium, uh, if it's going to be permanent, or gold, okay? So I had him the, the, the wedding bands, my old wedding bands, used to be palladium gold, silver, copper. Um, but in any case, to match the platinum iridium engagement ring, but anyway, that's another story. Um, anyway, so that's, those are, the, those are the blades, but actually, hold that one up again, or that one has the Christmas tree structure on the bottom, this convolute, which is this big, heavy base, because it's just mechanically attached to the disc. So now we're going to go back to Blisk. <clears throat> well, the problem is the, cr the disc in cross-section will look something like this. We'll have, we'll just call it a hub down here, right? And I have, this is the hub because this is where the high stresses are. It's all centrifugal forces, right? And so I have high stresses here because I have all this weight pulling on this on the hub. And up here, I have to have this big heavy thing at the end in order to have this Christmas tree, tree structure where the blade goes in. Okay? Well, the problem is I got all this weight out here because that's the outer circumference of this thing. And that weight puts high stresses on the hub. I could get 20 pounds off each one of these discs. These discs might weigh 100 pounds a piece. I could get 20% of the weight off of that if I could get rid of this great big heavy thing that is a mechanical attachment. And what they want to do is make a disc, I'll just draw half of it here, that you just weld the vein on directly. Put a weld in there, right? Get rid of this great big mechanical structure. When you mechanically bond things together, you usually have lots of extra weight because the mechanical joints, the contact stresses are going to be a few thousand PSI or tens, a few tens of thousands of PSI in bolts and things like that. Whereas in a welded joint, you'll get you know, 50 or 60 or 100,000 PSI. You can have a lot less material when you're not making mechanical joints when you actually have solid metal going through there with a weld. Well, if you could get 20 pounds off a disc, they estimate you could get about 200 pounds off an engine. You get 200 pounds off the engine, and it's out there hanging on these you know, long wings and stuff, you can get about 2,000 pounds off the frame of the aircraft. And that means that you can save a lot of money, either in fuel or in payload. An extra, you know, if you're talking about a, an Air, uh, Air Force fighter, an extra 2,000 pounds of payload or fuel means greater range or more bombs, right? That's for all. Some of those fighters only carry about 2,000 pounds of payload, okay? You could double your payload. You'd have to have half as many sorties and stuff. Um, so the Air Force, uh, one of the things they wanted to do to get back to friction welding, where we started some time ago, Instead of rotating, they actually were working on linear friction welding. You can feel the heat. Just rub your hands together, right? And you do that in a great big machine that's applying 20 or 30,000 pounds per square inch of downward force, and you rub these things together, and you could weld a blade to a disc. The only problem is it's sort of like the problem with the semiconductor chips. It's got to be a very reliable joining process because I'm going to make this part with all the blades on it, and these are single crystal blades worth $4,000 a piece, and I may have 100 blades going around a big disc, we're talking a lot of money. We're talking a half a million dollar part, and if one of those welds is bad, there's not a good repair technique to this process, okay? Not to say there isn't one. Actually, the Air Force has been working on this for 15 years or more, and they are starting to fly some of these things, is my understanding lately, okay? But that's how long it takes to develop these things. But a big payoff in energy savings. Um, and I think in the material selection and stuff, I may go through, which is the, not, the part you have to watch on video, I make the point that weight savings are more important the faster something goes. So if we're talking about a spinning wheel at 18,000 RPM or something, or maybe not 18 for those guys, maybe, maybe a few thousand if it's a big diameter, um, 
that's going to save a lot of money because of all the other things. Okay, so the faster something goes, the more important lightweight is. Friction welding is a reliable enough process. You can't go in there on the single crystals and stuff and, and do them by fusion welding. You can't melt the stuff. If you melt the stuff, you're going to lose the single crystals and all the good properties of that. So that's the, the bliss process. Another fusion welding process or friction welding process that's become popular, very popular for research, is linear friction welding. Ta -da. Friction stir welding. Yep, I'm sorry. Friction stir welding. Friction stir welding. I, should, I said linear friction welding. Friction stir welding. There's a picture of a friction stir well, stir, stir, stir well being made. This was developed um, uh, by a researcher over the British Welding Institute about 1990. I kind of suggested um, we developed from 1880 to about 1980 uh, about 150 different joining processes in the, you know, in the world. And I showed in a talk a few years ago that 75% of those were done in the first 50 years and the other 25% were done in the next 50 years. And I basically said, this is probably the only one we've done in the last 10 or 15 years in terms of a new, very new process. I mean, it depends on how you want to count. Maybe there's two or three. But the rate at which we're developing new joining technologies is certainly decreasing because after a while, you know, all the low-hanging fruit is gone. And it's hard to think of new things. But basically, anytime anyone comes up with a new heat source or a new way to clean a surface, they're going to do it. Now, this is a linear friction weld made by NASA. Uh, not, I mean, a friction stir weld. And the friction stir weld, you just spin this tool. In that case, it was a steel tool on aluminum plates. Boeing put in a facility to, uh, uh, for $10 million to friction stir weld parts of, of aircraft. And you have to have a very heavy base to hold the parts stationary. And then you have this high force. And you just spin, and you run this spinning mandrel down there. And you end up with a solid state weld. And the great thing in aluminum, it um, uh, essentially is a solid state weld. You got rid of the, you got so much um, interfacial shear with this tool going through there that you got rid of the surface contamination. You're forging it at the same time you're getting the high shear. And you end up with a solid state process that has no porosity because you didn't melt anything. When you melt aluminum, you typically get porosity from water, any source of moisture that's around, put hydrogen in the weld, and you get very low distortion. There's no distortion in that thing. One of the big problems in welding aluminum is the distortion. Now, it turns out there's a, a company, I think it's down in Texas, um, that is building kind of a competitor to the Learjet or Citation, you know, the small, the Premier, is, and that one of their claims to fame is they're getting much lighter construction and saving a lot of weight in this aircraft. Because they're using friction stir welding for the outside. No rivets. Again, you got to have rivets. You just doubled up the thickness, okay, of whatever you want. Plus, you actually have to use a greater thickness because you got the stress concentrations of the holes, right? Now, there are other problems with that, such as we learned, you know, at least in the Titanic, which is a riveted ship, we learned that if a crack starts, it stops at the end of the plate where the rivets are. In World War II, when we welded the ships, we learned that the crack goes all the way around because there's no crack stopping at the end of the plate. There is no end of the plate. Uh, so are we going to have more Aloha Airlines disasters, you know, where the, the whole top of the aircraft came off? Um, uh, that, in case, was, was riveted structure, and it was a heat crack that ran between the rivets. But once you start going to a monolithic, completely welded structure, there's nothing to stop the cracks, unless you put crack stoppers in. And in fact, that's one of the things they do on a long pipeline. On a long pipeline, steel pipeline, they will, because if you get a brittle fracture on a steel pipeline, um, there, there, is, there have been cases where a brittle fracture started in a steel pipeline, gas pipeline, and ran for 30 miles. Okay? Not a good day. Okay? Um, uh, and so the, in gas pipelines, they typically will put a crack stopper in. A crack stopper is nothing more than a piece of pipe that's about twice as thick. It only has to be about six inches long, but it's, it, it reduces the stress because you've got twice the cross-sectional area, and so the crack slows down, 
And if you, the people have done all these studies to find out how long it has to be, because the, cra- the brittle fracture is running at about a third to two thirds the speed of sound. Okay, if it's a true brittle fracture, and so you got to slow the crack down and give the chance, the metal a chance to deform and have some toughness. So, in big gas pipelines, they will put every every few hundred yards or every mile, they'll weld in this little ring of thicker, tougher material to stop long, brittle cracks. Now, you can stop long, brittle cracks by just having good, tough steel, which is actually another solution they're using now. But, but uh, in any case, does anyone know why a brittle crack? And it will run, it'll, it can run long distances in a gas pipeline, but not in an oil pipeline or a hydraulic pipeline. In a pneumatic line, you can have long, long cracks brittle cracks, but a brittle crack in a hydraulic line will not run very far. Anyone know why? Two reasons, stored energy and speed of sound. It turns out that the if I have a, a pipe that has got gas in it and the crack is running at one-third the speed of sound in the steel or the metal, the speed of sound in the metal is something on the order of 3,000 feet per second, okay, or yeah, no, 3,000 meters per second, about 10,000, close to 10,000 feet per second. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know the velocity of these gas molecules is on the order of a few hundred meters per second, and in fact, we know the speed of sound in air at sea level is 343.6 uh, meters per second. You don't remember that from high school physics? Speed of sound in air, something like that. That's dry air, okay? You, have, you know, not a lot of moisture. Any case, um, and that's because the, the molecules are eight atomic distances apart. If they're right next to each other, then it goes about, it's going to have to travel as far to bang into one another. And the speed of sound is limited by one atom, it's the domino effect of one atom hitting another atom all the way down. And so the speed of sound in a condensed phase, like a liquid or a gas, or a liquid or a solid, is about 10 times the speed of sound in a gas. So if I've got a pipeline, a steel pipeline or any other metal pipeline, actually any other pipe that, that has a brittle fracture running at, even if it's a thousand meters a second, but the speed of sound in the gas is only one third of that, then the crack always sees a fully pressurized pipe because the gas can't decompress as fast as the crack is running. So it's always, the crack tip is always at a fully pressurized pipe. If it's a liquid pipe, and now the de- decompression wave through the liquid is on the order of 3,000 meters a second, but the crack's only running at one third that speed. Well, the liquid decompresses because of the decompression wave, which runs really close to the speed of sound, faster than the uh, crack is growing, is running down the pipe. And so you don't have a high stress. Okay? So that's why hydraulics are better than pneumatics, they're safer. There's also a lot more stored energy in the. Uh, compressed gas rather than the compressed liquid. But the real reason is because of the speed and whether the crack tip is loaded. Um, okay, where are we? we? We may get through a review of what we did last time today. Uh, but we actually are going through other things. Um, cold welding requires high interfacial shear. We've talked about that. We've talked about linear, fr- linear friction and friction stir and uh, um, friction, other types of friction welding. Metals have an unusually large surface energies. Why? Because you get bonding from several surface layers. You have unsatisfied bonds, not just from the top layer of atoms, but from the second row and third row. And so they have two or three, four times the surface energy in a metal. That's going to become very important when we get to soldering and brazing and things like that, those surface energies. So a lot of this is kind of, well, if you had it before, it's, re- you know, from physical chemistry, it's a review. If you have it, then we're just trying to cover it. Um, there are something on the order of, 10 to the 13th thermal compression bonds made every year, and the Langmuir is 10 to the minus 8 atmosphere seconds. So I actually, when I came up with my 50 the other day, I actually looked back through the old nuts, notes. Semiconductor bonds, if I have 100 bonds per chip and a $100 billion business, um, that's, uh, and divide by $10 per chip. I was using a much cheaper chip I, at that time. I was, I used $200 billion yesterday, and I don't remember how many bonds for twenty dollars chips or something. Anyway, well, whether I'm off by whether it's fifty fifty billion fifty trillion 
bonds or whether it's 10 trillion or 5 trillion, it doesn't really matter. It's a lot. Now, if you compare that to spot welds in an automobile, remember we had that two little pieces of sheet metal and Elihu Thompson, who had been the president of MIT, invented that. Anybody else know what Elihu Thompson did? He, along with uh, uh, Thomas Edison, started General Electric Company up here in Lynn, Massachusetts. In fact, the laboratory at Lynn where they build aircraft engines is called the Thompson Lab. Okay. And Elihu Thompson was notable. Um, Thomas Edison had the most patents of any person at that time, and Elihu Thompson was number two. Okay. I think one of them had 400 patents and the other one had 300 patents or something. But Thompson was a professor of electrical engineering here. Um, anyway, so far as automobiles, if I make 30 million automobiles a year, a year and there's 3,500 welds in each one, I just pick 3,530 because I end up with um, 10 to the 11, which is one or two orders of magnitude less than the number of thermal compression welds that I use in semiconductor chips. But I'm going to have 10 to the 11th. And if it costs somewhere between a nickel and 10 cents to make each one of those welds in an automobile, then it turns out I've got a $10 billion business just for making resistance welds in automobiles. And you ought to, hopefully, you, if you haven't learned to do these types of estimates before, um, it's a worthwhile thing to be able to do to figure out whether someone's loaded, giving you a load of bull or not. Okay? Uh, and you actually know enough information in many cases to figure out estimates. I did this with a freshman class a few years ago. And uh, I mean, I, things like how do you estimate, um, uh, are, how do you, the tallest mountain in the, in the world is Mount Everest, right? And it's about 30,000 feet. Anybody know what limits the height of Mount Everest? Everest? Turns out it's gravity and the strength of rock. Okay, if you make something too tall, it'll just collapse under its own weight, right? So, would you expect mountains to be taller on Venus or shorter? And then what about Jupiter? Well, the strength of materials don't vary by planet, although Jupiter may be a gaseous planet and, you know, frozen, frozen gas, but it's still got strengths on the order of five or 10,000 PSI, okay? The strength of chemical bonds doesn't change depending on which planet you're on. It turns out we don't know, because Jupiter is covered, what the tallest mountains are on Jupiter. But we have measured the tallest mountain on Venus. And the tallest mountain on Venus is about 45,000 feet, rather than 30,000 feet. If you divide by gravity on the two planets, you get, you normalize it to, uh, actually if you multiply by the coefficient of gravity, uh, by the gravi gravitational constant, you get a constant, which works out if you actually did the mechanics for the strength of the material. Okay, so that's just one way to estimate things. So you could conclude that there are not a lot of tall mountains on Jupiter because it has much heavier gravity, much stronger gravity. Jupiter is going to be a very flat planet. The less gravity, the more torturous the surface of the planet, right? You're an extraterrestrial guy, right? Does that all make sense? Okay. Um, so um, it actually is useful to be able to take little bits of information you know and figure out what makes sense in the long run. Um, now, since we finished the review and we've got 10 minutes left of this hour, um, let's talk about the contact area during cold welding. And you should have this, uh, this guy somewhere in your notes. Um, if I look at the nominal flat surfaces, you know, putting this on this, I'd say that's the contact area. And if I press down on this, there's a certain pressure per unit area. And we can talk about the compressive yield strength of the material. So I'm just, this is the macroscopic view of squeezing two flat surfaces together. Because the surfaces do, on macroscopic, they do look flat. And I can talk about a compressive yield strength. But if I were to do the microscopic view of that same thing, it turns out I have these little surface asperities and it only contacts at the surface disparities. And I want to know what that area of contact is. Well, it turns out for a hardness indentation, the hardness, a hardness indentation has about three times the compressive yield strength of a material. 
Anybody know why that is? So if I've got this hardness in denner, I'm doing a hardness test on a piece of material, and I'm just trying to push that in denner into this surface, okay? Squeeze it down. It takes, uh, based on this area of this indenter on this great big thing, it takes about three times as much force as if I just had a simple geometry like this pressing against something like this. Why would it take more force here than here? Here I'm just going to mushroom these two guys, right? What do I mushroom here? I might mushroom this guy, but I can't mushroom this guy very well because he's all supported on either side, right? There's the constraint. This guy is free to expand outward. This guy is not. And in fact, you can go through something called slip line flow field theory, which is an old-fashioned way to solve complex plasticity problems. And you basically, and you actually can do experiments and see where the deformed metal is. You'll find that in something like this, I may deform an area on either side that has a depth equal to the diameter of the two rods that I'm squeezing, right? Here, I'm going to deform something that's a lot more than just this area up here in this material. In order to do that extra work, it takes about three times the force. Actually, in slip line flow field theory, it's actually 1 plus pi over 2, which is 2.57. Not three, but 2.57. Who cares, right? <laughs> That's assuming no work hardening. Um, perfectly elastic type of, type of thing. So a hardness test where I'm indenting a material into another. Well, in a sense, I'm indenting this into, into here. These, these mountain peaks are being indented into the valleys or, or into the other mountain peaks, the sides of the things. And if I just said, well... Now, the microscopic contact deformation pressure is three times the yield strength, and that's the force divided by the true area of contact. Well, the two forces, macroscopically and microscopically, that I'm imposing on my system from the surroundings are the same. And if you go through all this, that factor of three comes out and tells you that the area, the true area of contact, at the maximum is going to be about one-third the apparent area. So that if I actually get to the point where these things start to physically deform and then I were to pry them apart, I would find that I only deformed the, about one-third of those areas and two-thirds of the valleys would still be pristine. Okay, That's just a very crude way to do it, but it turns out you can do the experiment uh, and you'll find that that's what's ha what happens. I mean, in a, in a fatigue crack, when it opens and closes, you'll get rough surfaces on either side, and you'll get peening of the surfaces as they deform each other. And when you look at that thing, you'll find that something on the order of 30 to 50 percent is deformed, but the other 30 to 50 percent are the undeformed valleys, right? And I've already started to deform the material. So by straight downward force, the maximum area of contact I can get is one-third. And so if I had perfectly clean surfaces, gold doesn't form oxides or other things, and I try to squeeze on ultra-clean gold, and I actually get to the point where I deform it, I still only get about one-third the strength of the bulk material at that joint. If I have something that has contamination, like aluminum, aluminum oxide, and I squeeze straight down, I'll get no strength at all because even the areas where it deforms, I haven't gotten anything. The only way to get good bonding is to get on something that's contaminated is to get lots of interfacial shear. And that's what we do with friction welding. Now there's something called ultrasonic welding. Anyone ever heard of ultrasonic welding? Anyone ever seen ultrasonic welding? Um, in ultrasonic welding, it's sort of like the spot weld we talked about before. You've got a, a sheet of metal here and you've got another sheet of metal here and you, and you may have a big anvil down here where you're trying to join these two sheets of metal. In resistance spot welding, you'd pass a current through here and melt this little region here. But in ultrasonic welding, you actually have a piezoelectric horn transducer. Actually, if I got time here, the horn will typically have a shape like this where it expands outward. 
So I'm vibrating this back and forth to get interfacial shear across here. Why do I make it like this? You guys are in the, you're all surface guys, right? No subs. You guys use sonar on surface ships, right? Why do I, why do I make the horn taper down? Force times the distance. If I have a certain force, which is proportional to the area here, and I squeeze and concentrate all that force here, the energy through here is going to give more displacement as I taper the horn down. I'll get more movement. Okay, so by shaping this horn, you can actually, the vibrational energy tends to concentrate and you get more displacement. Okay, so you get more shear. So it's ultrasonic. So it, typically at fre frequencies on the order of 100,000 hertz. Anything above 20,000 is ultrasonic roughly for, for humans. But at about 100,000 hertz, you use a piezoelectric driver and you just vibrate this thing, and that vibrates the interface down here. And hopefully you've got something here that contaminated this surface so you don't weld your electrode to your, to your plate, but that happens, okay? Um, and you can weld these materials together by just vibrating them, getting interfacial shear. Where did the surface contamination go if this was aluminum? It's still there, okay? All you did was rearrange it on a microscopic scale. And that's a problem. That's a big problem. Um, now, um, last Friday, one week ago, I was at Ford, and they have been looking at this because they want to join aluminum. And I mentioned you couldn't make resistant spot welds in aluminum very well. Um, so they've been looking at ultrasonic welding to join sheets for automobiles. And I think that some of this they're actually using on the Jaguar now. Um, but they basically take this, this electrode, and they put a series of grooves in it which they worked out the spacing and all this stuff. And they squeeze, you got to force squeezing this down to give you a downward pressure, but then you have the vibration side to side to give you shear. And you got your sheets of aluminum in here. And you, they basically just have a flat flatten down here, although it, it actually has some little, it has some embossment so it doesn't slide here. You want to get all your en sliding energy at this interface and out of these interfaces. So they kind of lock it up. And they have enough force, and it sort of amazes me. They said that their pressures were such, there's only like five or 10,000 PSI, which is not enough, should not be enough, to deform this metal. But when it's all done, this stuff does take a, a permanent set. You get a, the whole thing gets depressed in here, and they get a very good weld down in here. But if you look at the microstructure, this whole thing, that interface has now been turned upside down on itself. Tremendous shears in there. It's like someone went in there in a friction stir weld and stirred up the aluminum. But they're doing it with very small, you know, hundreds of thousands of very small displacements. They can make that weld in about a third of a second, just like re resistance spot welds. Uh, but they're getting tremendous interfacial shear here by, by having designed the process uh, this way. And so it looks like they may come up with something that. Uh, could replace the old electrical resistance spot welding that we've been using for automobiles for 80 years, um, at least in aluminum. Now the problem is, actually they've, they've solved part of the problem in that um, in the old days, the old days being 15 years ago, they had great big anvils and presses because so, you're just doing a lot of mechanical force there to back things up. They've actually got the weight of the basic unit down to something similar to those great big electrical cables in the resistance spot welding. In fact, they have this on robots now. So robots, the whole thing may, the whole unit may weigh 100 or 150 pounds. So it can be moved around the vehicle with a robot. There are some other problems that they're still working out. So they're not ready to go in high volume production yet. But it's a pretty interesting process. But you get tremendous interfacial shear. Without the interfacial shear, no welds because your true area contact at best would be about one third of everything else. So, um, I guess we didn't get to electrical bonding and thermal compression welds, but we'll do that on Monday. See, we finished reviewing what we did last time. But I think we covered some other things.